for getting folks up. And while we do, I'll give a preview about uh, sort of the main topic at hand, uh, which is about privacy. You know, privacy is a big thing on the blockchain. It's a big issue. Um, you know, even, uh, you know, sometime last year, we had Italic, uh, Vitalik Buter and the co-founder of Ethereum talking about, you know, privacy pools. Um, we talked the other day about, uh, you know, ZK. And uh, of course, uh, there's always the, you know, Monero several years ago, there had had a bit of a hype around it, given um, the fact that it was seen as, as being able to do privacy. But there's also issues with privacy. And the issues around privacy are around government uh, controls, of course. So how do you you know, so we had the issues with things like um, Tornado Cash. Uh, Tornado Cash was, of course, you know, effectively banned by the U.S. government, but it was a way to try to have private, uh, you know, transactions on the blockchain. So maybe actually for the audience we have gathered here today, um, the the thing you have to think about is whenever you transact on most blockchains, right? I mean, certainly the big L1s, you know, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, those are very public um, those are very public. Uh, uh, those are all public, in fact, transactions, and that's something a lot of people don't necessarily think about uh, when they transact. But you know, you're you're you know buying your pizza for however many uh, you know satoshis uh, will will stand the test of time. So the question has always been around how do you um, how do you achieve and maintain privacy given that privacy in the age of AI is it becoming an ever more present uh, topic. So um, yeah, Zach, welcome uh, to the space. Um, before we dive into the main you know, the issues at hand, we like to start with maybe updates, you know, what's happening, uh, you know, in the news and things like that. So we'd love to hear uh, what's happening in your world. Of course, I think the biggest thing happening for most uh, Bitcoiners or most people in crypto is uh, crypto is on a bit of a bit of a tear. Uh, so we're above 52K at this point per coin for Bitcoin. Um, but Zach would be happy to hear your updates about what's happening uh, in the world of crypto. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. Um, I think the, what I'm mostly seeing has to do with the rise in prices, which is an uptick in private market activity. Um, my day job is <clears throat> I'm a lawyer for Bitcoin and crypto startups, and we're seeing more, especially early stage deals uh, than there have been in the previous months and you know more VC money coming into the space. Uh, and the big themes that are funded in the broader crypto space right now, uh, real world asset tokenization, um, decentralized uh, infrastructure deep in, um, and then, you know, ZK rollups are big and infrastructure plays. So when you mean, so what do you mean by early stage? So like, what are we talking about? Pre-seed, seed, you know, series A, and also what kind of like sizes are we talking about? What kind of valuations just in general? I'm just curious to see where the general market's at. Yeah, I think all of the above by, by early stage, I mean, pre-token launch. Um, and the sizes really depend on who the founder is and, and who the VCs are. At the smaller end, you know, I, I think you see equity deals where the tokens haven't really been priced yet. You do an early stage sort of safe agreement that has warrants attached with the idea of some future token. Then there are more advanced projects where the token is really factored into the valuation. I would say on the lower end, those tend to be like a $20 million fully diluted value for the token pre-launch. At the higher end, closer to $100 million fully diluted value pre-launch. <clears throat> And then, you know, you, you tend to see some of these bigger valuations overseas where in the United States, if you're raising money for a pre-launch crypto project, it's usually you're doing an equity fundraise with token warrants attached to it to give to your investors. Uh, abroad, there are sort of more old school instruments like SAFTs where people are directly selling token interests and, and those tend to be at higher valuations because they, they can more imminently launch. No, that's interesting. So, right, because SAFs were really popular in the U.S. Uh, a little little while ago, but they are no longer... Uh, in 2017, more... 2018, in the ICO era, they were popular, but they've fallen out of favor because they've been, you know, essentially they've been lost in court uh, against the SEC. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so let, let, let's talk about that. So, um, are you mostly focusing on overseas types of plays then? Or, and because like, no, there's, think... been, there's, been a, there's been a chatter, especially last year with, you know, what happened with... Um, you know, what's happening with Coinbase, uh, you know, the SEC, and, and certainly, of course, Binance, which is not US-based. But, uh, you know, there's like a lot of chatter, people saying, oh, you know, if I would never, I would not, no longer recommend we start a crypto company, you know, in the United States. Uh, you know, you've got great prominent companies like DYDX based out of Brooklyn, and they can service the entire world with their, you know, I mean, they're like, basically, they're DeFi derivatives, uh, except for Americans, right? So, you know, like, it's kind of ironic. Do you think that that still holds or is the U.S. still a fertile place for crypto development? And if so, in the U.S., then where in the U.S., right? 
Bay Area in New York, of course, come to mind, but I'd love to hear you, you're seeing it. Yeah, for sure. Work. So I work with companies, again, across the spectrum, some entirely based in the U.S., some entirely based abroad. Um, but I think the most common structure you're seeing for these sort of well-heeled crypto projects has both a U.S. and an overseas element. So the main startup, the thing that gets funded, is a Delaware C corporation, so incorporated in Delaware and headquartered wherever the founders are. So a lot in California and New York, but it's really across the United States, depending on where the founders are. And that company you know, that is, is the one that receives VC money. <clears throat> the name usually ends in labs. And the regulatory framework, this is, uh, I mean, I'm personally pretty skeptical of this, but this is sort of what the big firms have pushed out, the big law firms in this space. Um, you have the Labs Co. based in the United States that owns the intellectual property for whatever protocol is being created. Then you have two or three overseas entities. In the simplest version, there's two. Uh, there's usually a foundation and you know, the Cayman Islands is the most common place for this. You have a Cayman Foundation that doesn't have shareholders. That is going to be the token issuer of record, and that'll happen outside of the United States. And then you'll have an operating subsidiary of the foundation, uh, which is you know oftentimes in the British Virgin Islands, and that will contract with the U.S. entity. And the sort of idea here is the U.S. entity creates the technology, creates the IP, gives it to uh, under a license to the offshore foundation in the Cayman. The offshore foundation, the Cayman mints the tokens so that you can say that the US company is not the one who created the token. In exchange for that license of IP, the uh, foundation will give some, you know, generally pretty large percentage, maybe half of the tokens to the US Delaware C Corp. And the US Delaware C Corp will use that to reward uh, VC investors who hold token warrants and use it to reward team members through incentive plans with the company. And then the foundation will do the public launch of the token, usually on a DEX. Uh, so there's an international element. There's a, you know, a, an idea that you want to segregate out the um, U.S. entity from the token issuance. And I don't know, we'll see how well that structure, it's, it's not been so directly challenged in court yet, but that is the most common structure that's being set up. And where are you seeing, like, so where is the operational teams for these kinds of structures, right? It's usually so, the United States. Got it, got it. So you're, you're, what you're describing is a U.S. Count, US, count, US team um, trying to effectively do token launches, but uh, this is like... But do it out of the Cayman field. Foundation, yes. Okay, makes makes sense. I mean, there's plenty of hedge funds and stuff based out of Cayman, the Cayman Islands and um, other types of... So uh, what kind of plays are interesting in that case? So... When you look at ideas, right? So what's uh, what's typically? I'm, well, I'm curious what's hot, you know, because I mean VCs, a lot of VCs. I mean, I used to be VC, so uh, I find this very interesting. Uh, but I do find there's a lot of groupthink sometimes. Uh, not all the times, of course. But uh, I'm curious what your hot takes are. But outside of before the hot takes, you know, if you ask a typical crypto VC right now, what what's like the cool thing? What's the interesting play? Yeah, RWA, I think, is the real world asset tokenization is sort of the hot thing. Personally, I'm very skeptical of the investment thesis for that. I think there's a lot of hype and there's not a lot of value. Why, why are you skeptical? Well, why are, why are people excited about RWAs and why are you skeptical? Uh, I think the reason, the reason people are excited about RWAs is it's sort of easy to imagine what that world looks like, right? That a lot of the ways to move assets around are complicated, they're cumbersome, they're on paper, and the idea that you could move assets sort of effortlessly across borders, you could have very specific tokenized, a very small piece of real estate, a piece of an artwork, whatever, uh, on the blockchain, you know, that's been a, a narrative going on for a long time. Um, I, you know, and, and then tokenize sort of any other thing you can imagine. Uh, the reason why I'm skeptical of that, one is the securities laws. Uh, you just can't really legally do the things that you're going to want to do with, for example, tokenized real estate. And we're not... Well, I mean, those, those are just, those are assuredly past the Howey test, right? So, yeah. I mean, like, like, isn't that the idea that those are, those you don't are even security really tokens? Need to to yeah. apply the Howey test. Those are just literal securities on the blockchain. And oh, exactly, you don't yeah. have good, like, legal... You're taking securities and you're putting them on the blockchain, right? And I mean, you know, what is it? Uh, you know, Terra Luna tried to do this by creating synthetic, like, Tesla stock. And uh, certainly, you know, the U.S. I mean, uh, ironically, that, right? ironically, they did such a bad job of that, that those were not considered securities by the Southern District of New York in the case. That was the only Terra Luna asset found not to be a securities offering from the, the mirror protocol. The other reason I'm not excited about RWA is because to the extent that you have a physical thing, right, like a, a watch and then you have an NFT represent that watch or my girlfriend has a bag that has an NFT associated with it. Uh, what value other than as just a, a certificate of authenticity does the NFT have outside of the physical object? And if the TAM here is just certificates of authenticity, 
I think that's less exciting. The, yeah, and, people, that, and VCs can talk about like TAMs of like trillions of dollars, right? Because it's like, oh yeah, just take the world yeah. and like you know tokenize it. But it's it's you know it's like I was you know uh, what is it? Uh, I was talking to David Schwartz from Ripple, um, uh, and you know they were doing Columbia land deeds right in Colombia, which is actually a real problem, right? You know like land and who owns what. So putting on blockchain sounds great, but the the problem that I have is if if the if the L one if your blockchain does not match with you know if the ledger doesn't match with what the Columbia court says about who owns what, then the ledger is wrong. Right. And so this is actually yeah. the what, problem what I have. Mean to own there's land. no direct it means, correlation. It means right? the local authority will exercise its monopoly on violence to make sure exactly. that you are the one who has access to that land or gets control who has access to the land and not someone else. And, you know, unless you have actual laws that like honor the blockchain as the source of truth there, the fact that you've tokenized that land isn't really all that valuable. I think the yeah, thing that fine. is valuable that I'm seeing getting funded, although this is has its own very big securities law challenges, is like, quote unquote, real yield. Right. It's so you have some sort of protocol, whether it's a lending protocol, a trading protocol, et cetera, that has yield that goes to governance token holders that are denominated in stable coins or in something like Ethereum that are not just their inflated token like we saw last cycle. I think that's yeah. really cool. I mean, the problem is that in most cases, that's going to obviously look like a security under the Howey test because you have something that looks like ownership of the protocol that's paying out dividends. Yeah. Um, Efforts of others, like, you know, expectation return, all that. Yeah. Mm hmm. But if you look at something like GMX, right, where like they are actually, it's an ongoing business, whether or not that business is legal, and it is paying actual yield that is not due to just inflation of their governance token, like that seems like something that will be sustainable over time. Uh, right now, I think that a lot of those teams are anonymous and abroad because the, you know, the SEC is not allowing these projects. But yeah. that is the type of thing I think could evolve into something more like the the dis real sort of decentralized finance that people are, are interested in. Yeah, Zach, you know, I could go on this forever, but we do have other hands which I want to get to. So maybe just real quick lightning round, like what other areas you find attractive? Maybe just like quick list of, you know, so you said RWA is popular, you don't find attractive, like just a quick list of other things. Yeah, Bitcoin stuff is really big right now. Bitcoin NFTs, Bitcoin meme coins, Bitcoin decentralized finance. I think there are going to be interesting things with Federated, Xiaomi, and Mints coming out on the Bitcoin side. Um, you know, different kinds of identity markers. You know, use cases of blockchain for attestations is really interesting. I mentioned before decentralized infrastructure, so people using uh, blockchain as an incentive mechanism to get people to share data in a way that was not possible before or to make statements that are verifiable. I think that'll all be pretty cool. Very cool. Yeah, lots of stuff. All right, we got some hands. Um, so before we go to them, the though, uh, shout out to our sponsor, our partner for today, Serenity Shield. Uh, they're in the space and we have something about them posted at the top. We will have an AMA about them with them in the last 15 minutes of the space. Uh, but yeah, Wendy, uh, what do you think about what Zach just said? No, I just wanted to comment and say I that there's a lot of forward thinking here, which is absolutely awesome. But when I think about RWAs, I'm not even thinking about things that are being done internationally or being able to be an American citizen and transferring my real estate or tokenizing it and transferring it overseas and letting people trade it or whatever. I'm more think I'm thinking more so about people that are in the United States of America that just want to have their record, some of their the public records, like you know if you own property or not, on a blockchain to where they can get direct access to that, so they don't have to go down to the courthouse or down to the city to pull permits and do all those things, I would think I think it would make things a lot easier that way. Um, so that's when I hear about RWAs, that's one of the use cases for me. And then, of course, with music NFTs and whatnot. But I would like to see some of the small feats get accomplished first before we start to get crazy and start talking about, you know, transferring a property from the U.S. to Colombia or to Mexico or X, Y, and Z. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, um, you know, I mean, I, out of curiosity, when you say music NFTs, I'm curious to dive into some of that. We've had a few spaces about it, but uh, what, um, what's been interesting there? No, as far as music NFTs go, I don't think people understand how predatory a lot of the record labels are and how much they actually, how much ownership they actually take. Um, I come from a family with a lot of musicians in it, and um, I have a bunch of friends that are music men, and the stories that I've heard in the past about how horrible these labels can be, it just makes me super excited to see NFTs kind of take you know, hopefully they end up developing into a way where these musicians and these artists and these entertainers are able to make an actual living with their fans and let their fans be a part of the whole entire process with, with completely removing the third parties. Because at the end of the day, with social media that we have today, you don't need a lot of these record labels to get famous or to get well known or to sell out shows. So I just hope to see a lot more of that happen. Um, through RWAs and through NFTs, however they, however these companies are able to come up with that. Because um, again, yeah. go ahead. 
Yeah. So, I mean, uh, interestingly, so yeah, I, mean, I have some, I, mean, I have a family of musicians. I myself am not one as my family has been very blunt in telling me, but, uh, but, um, you know, my, uh, you know, my wife is a, you know, had a number one song. She's a Korean pop singer, had a number one song in Korea in the Korean pop charts. And I, I was interested after I, after the fact, I learned uh, a lot about how much money she got versus the record labels. And I was appalled at how little <laughs> she got for having a number one song in a country, right. For a while. So, um, yeah, I mean, but, but at the same time, you know, I talked to her about the idea of music NFTs. I know a lot of people here on X who are doing that stuff. But it's like, it's almost like a little niche market, right? Because the distribution is still owned by, well, now it's like Spotify and even Apple Music, which sponsored the Super Bowl. Um, but I mean, you're right. And I think what's interesting is there's something called the PROs, so BMI, ASCAP, these like things that all in weird, right? Like they operate, you know, they like, you know, if you, if you perform an usher song somewhere, then you got to pay some mechanical royalties and the other fees that automatically go out. Uh, otherwise, they could like sue you or whatever. And um, I feel like that method, if it were on a blockchain uh, and the ledger was correct, would actually be an interesting way. And I bet the um, you could cut out the middle people and you could get uh, the artist to get more, which I, I would which I would be uh, supportive of. But like today, well, when it's yeah, well, yeah go for definitely. It. Well, first, I wanted to say, send me your who your wife is. I, my daughter's super into K-pop right now. We're actually making her a K, my boyfriend's making her a K-pop song. So I'd love to um, show my daughter your wife's work. But honestly, I just I feel like we're so early when it comes to music NFTs. We haven't even scratched the surface yet. Like I'm, I'm pretty good friends with quite a few of the music NFT artists in the space currently. Um, and I just would like to see more, you know, and I keep pitching the idea to my friends who are musicians in the real world. And they're just kind of not sold on it yet because it's still a little bit complex for them but again we're still very early when it comes to that and as far as the liquidity goes and, and all of that that different type of aspect um i do think that um once these platforms or once we're able to create a mechanism that artists can just go ahead and um upload or not i don't want to say upload but put their music on the blockchain and piece and fractionalize those nfts for merchandising and licensing and royalties and all of that i think it will be a game changer but again we are super 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 early and i'm just here to watch the whole entire industry transform from beta to you know to something that actually um allows these artists to earn and get what they're deserved yeah totally agree power to that and i feel like we could have our whole space on that so um but yeah definitely will do uh so um yeah thanks for that wendy appreciated that and uh, hopefully we can get artists paid paid better it's one of the great use cases of crypto sort of democratization uh, and sort of the cutting out of the middle middle folks uh so terence um you had your hand up we'd love to go to you and then powell uh what are some of the things happening in your world? And of course, a uh, shout out today to Serenity Shield. Uh, we're going to be talking about privacy coins and just privacy on the blockchain in general. We're going to be moving to that in a few minutes. Uh, so that should be pretty, uh, pretty exciting. By the way, we encourage comments. So there's a purple button on the lower right for the audience. Feel free to ask questions for the audience here uh, and for Serenity Shield. And uh, also, we got a newsletter pinned to the top. So yeah, Terrence and Paul, uh, go for it. Uh, sure. So I work at Swan Bitcoin, a Bitcoin only company, not speaking on their behalf. So these are just my opinions. But basically, um, we see a lot of people interested in understanding the difference between an ETF, right? Bitcoin ETF versus Bitcoin. And so the key is education there. I feel like um, we have a chance to get a lot of people who trust Fidelity and BlackRock. And that's been a great legitimizer for the our industry and to chance to educate them about the benefits of having real Bitcoin that you can self custody instead of relying on counterparty risk after counterparty risk. And a lot of these folks are custodying to Coinbase, which is not great. I think it's about at least seven of the top t uh, of the 10 Bitcoin ETFs custody to Coinbase. So that's a central point of failure. And obviously, your Bitcoin can be much more easily confiscated, censored, taxed, um, and so forth if you have an NFT, sorry, an ETF versus Bitcoin. Plus, the, the ETFs, you don't even get real Bitcoin. You can only redeem for cash. So many um, benefits to having real Bitcoin, including being, being able to buy it 24-7. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think a lot, you got a lot of, you got a lot of uh, folks who I think support that. Not your keys, not your coin. Uh, Paul. Um, so um, I will also jump into the tokenization space as this is something that I do daily, like tokenization, hedge funds, tokenization, APY from traditional markets, this and that. And I believe 
that there are a couple of factors that are super important. Like like many protocols in the crypto, like DeFi loan, lending, this and that, are like self-sustainable. They just work because there is a, there is a smart contract that handles all the operation. With AWS, the very important element would be the third parties, the trusted third parties that will handle the custody, that will handle the assets that are underneath. So that, that's one of the key elements of the whole uh, tokenization space and as we see right now like a lot of big guys like i was just speaking with jamie diamond in uh, in in davos uh, about when he said that bitcoin is shit and after that he said that tokenization is something that they all that they are going all in so like all those big guys are putting like all the money onto the tokenization rws this and that why because they see capital in that right right now imagine we have a uh, uh, a stock of Berkshire Hathaway, 600k per, per one share. Like no one can afford that. There is no liquidity because the one piece of that is too expensive. With tokenization, you have 24-7 tradability on that. With tokenization, you have uh, fractionalization. So even guy with five bucks in their pockets can, can uh, jump in into being a, a small fractionalized shareholder of such a stock. So, so like I believe that the next decade will be huge in terms of usage of tokenization or WAs because as those big guys are saying this is a new opening for the financial markets like right now you can buy oil contracts and if the OPEC will cut by 50 percent um, oil production on uh, uh, Sunday on Saturday sorry you will have a very bad Sunday and Monday the market will open with so big gap and you can do nothing with that with uh, uh, moving all those assets onto the blockchain, you have tradability 24-7. You can react, you can do the damage control, like all those elements. And like uh, I, I believe that those markets will, will develop heavily. And there are signs that shows that uh, this is happening, especially the regulations. Like uh, Very often people are just saying that there are two type of tokens, utility and security. And basically security is not the token, it's a lo- banking and financial law. And the, the fun fact that the new regulations that are stepping in, like in Europe, you have three new regulations that are, you know, changing this completely from scratch. Uh, Mika, Dora, and DLT pilot, pilot regime. And Mika is handling the new type of classification of tokens. So they say there are stable coins, there are hybrid tokens, utility tokens, and the most important, something that the whole industry of tokenization and RWA will rely on is uh, the type of token that they are calling ART, so asset related token, which is a like some sort of crypto derivative that it has been set on this space before, but with the difference that there is no whole burden of the financial market. It's like a lightweight derivative. And this is uh, the type of token, the new classification that is going to be in- introduced in Europe. I was speaking with some people from SAC side. I was speaking with MAS. So this is like Singapore um, regulator. And all of those um, regulators are thinking about introducing very similar, uh, very similar regulations. So like RWS is going to be the hot thing because those big guys, like long story short, because big guys are putting all the money where their mouth is. And the regulations will jump together with that because they will lobby for that. And I believe this will develop the whole space further very, very much in the next uh, years, like decade or something. Man, pal, I, I feel like you just talked about like 10 different spaces we could, we could host, but it was it was great to get that kind of overview. I definitely agree. I think we're going to move to privacy coins, uh, by the way. But, you know, def- definitely agree. I think the 24-7 tradeability, we could even, you know, discuss that. I mean, Berkshire Hathaway, by the way, does have B-class shares, right, which only are 400 bucks instead of, you know, tens of thousands. Uh, so there, there's that. But it, you're right, it doesn't trade 24-7. And I, I noticed that even on the corporate side during the SVB crisis when it, when it collapsed last year. Um, it was interesting to see that uh, when we're trying to make a bunch of crypto trades, because, you know, Circle uh, had, had reported I had about $3 billion in there. So USDC was going down below $0.90. Cents, and we're trying to make some trades. And so we had Singapore traders on Friday night for our time US uh, doing stuff. Um, so it, it, it was just like, actually it worked out. Right. So it was kind of interesting, but it actually turned out that TradFi really, like really failed us, uh, during that time. I mean, obviously our bank collapsed. I mean, we were corporate banking with SVB as a startup, uh, uh, and I've been a client of SVB for, I don't know, a decade now at this point. Um, so, uh, and thankfully we had a JP Morgan account as well. So that's certainly what we were just all stuck there, but it, it was interesting that when TradFi failed us, you know, uh, crypto what was there, right? And we were able to make all the trades and, and actually do some interesting things on DEXs, um, even when uh, CFI wasn't uh, something we could uh, rely on. But, um, but I want to pivot the conversation now to sort of the, the you know, the, the, the theme at hand today, which is related to privacy uh, on the blockchain. So before all the speakers joined, 
I'll tee up the conversation again. So this is what I said in the beginning, and that is that privacy on the blockchain is something uh, I think that is underappreciated uh, by a lot of folks, especially retail, right? I think who don't realize that every transaction you do is out there for the public record. Um, you know, so, you know, there's just something that a lot of us don't think about. I mean, a few years ago, even Monero, the privacy coin, you know, had, had a bit of a, a hype around it just because people thought, okay, this could be the way. Uh, but then there was research saying that, you know, certain, you know, folks, uh, you know, certain government agencies could figure out a good percentage of Monero transactions. Uh, you know, Tornado Cash was another thought, another way uh, to sort of, you know, be able to hide sort of what you're doing. And of course, you know, folks, uh, because of the money laundering implications that that in fact is some of the U.S. people in the U.S. Uh, actually cannot take card in. So um, privacy. Yeah. Who, who wants to tee us up? We're just going to talk about privacy in general. And then we're going to talk about uh, going to our uh, folks at Serenity to, to talk about what their solution is. But yeah, Wendy, what do you think of privacy on the blockchain? <laughs> No, I'm super excited to be on the space about privacy. I feel like we take it for granted so often in our daily lives. Like I'm a mom, I've got a seven year old daughter and you know, I do, I do quite a few transactions in crypto per week. And let's just talk, well, I mean, we can really kind of talk about when crypto does become accepted by the masses and we are making transactions for daily purchases, like going to the grocery store, running to the drugstore, et cetera. I don't want people tracking me. It's not because I'm doing anything wrong. It's not because I'm hiding anything. I just don't want to be tracked. I don't want to be followed. And I feel like there's a big security risk for that. And a lot of people People don't understand that. I feel like we're so accustomed in America, especially, and I'm just going to speak for Americans right now, but we're so accustomed to just kind of relying on our government and relying on the public servants and relying on these companies, especially a lot of these financial companies. I believe it was Mr. Cooper, which is the largest mortgage. Um, they're one of the mortgage companies we use for to pay the payment. I forget exactly what they're called, but they were their database was breached on Halloween and people didn't find out till two or three weeks later just primarily because that's the way the laws are written here. And I feel like Americans we just expect people to take care of our privacy and if something happens we can just call the bank, etc. But that's not necessarily the case. And it's just very unfortunate that that's what we're seeing happening in current society. But at the same time, that's one of the reasons why I advocate so heavily for privacy coins and for people that are building in the space. And one of the projects that I'm advising on Squid Grow, they're just dropping a you know a cross chain deck aggregator that essentially makes everything private called silent swap and again like privacy is very very important to every single person regardless if you're doing something wrong or you're, or you're a law-abiding citizen i do believe everybody do has does deserve some extent of privacy because we don't want the government we don't want these big co corporations and companies looking into our private life and i know most of you that are listening to this you'll be on amazon browsing something and then you'll, you know, head over to X or head over to TikTok or whatever, and you'll see an ad for that pop up. To me, that's invasive. I don't want that happening. So I don't know. That's just my personal opinion about it. And I do believe that I, I feel like all of this attack against privacy, especially with Tornado Cash and the privacy coins, I know a lot of them were delisted from Binance recently. I feel like it's just a direct attack on our freedom, on our liberty, and it's just another way to push through the CBDC because that's what's coming. And with that CBDC, it's not going to be private. They're going to pitch it to us like it's private, but it's not going to be. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, I agree with all the things you said. And actually, I think crypto uniquely, right? Um, I mean, I also work in spatial computing, VR, and there's all this uh, stuff about you know, uh, the Apple Vision Pro. But of course, I mean, if, if you think about what Meta owns for the, you know, tracking every camera in your space and yourself, I mean, the privacy is really, you know, really out the window. And, you know, I mean, uh, you know, Facebook Meta is not necessarily known as the most privacy friendly company. But I guess, you know, crypto uniquely as, a, as an industry is an industry that has, you know, grown out of distrust of centralized authorities or distrust of large, you know, companies, for example. Um, I mean, that's where it started from. And that's where a lot of the ethos still stands. So, I mean, it's kind of an interesting place where you'd think privacy would matter more. And, and I think it does. I mean, I think like the fact that it resonates with you and probably a lot of people on the call, we got a lot of hands going up about this. But like, what's your theory? What's your thought around why it isn't actually even more like paid attention to, right? I mean, I'd say like, a lot of people don't think about, you know, you know, every transaction and the fact that it will stand the test of time for as long as that L1 exists, even in crypto. Are you asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm like, I'm sorry. No, um, um, no, I can you ask the question again? Yeah, sure. Just like, something. why aren't people more privacy focused in crypto and crypto you think are the P are the kinds of people that would want to, that like basically by the ethos of crypto from the beginning would want to do privacy like more 
Like, because a lot of people grift in this space. That's why a lot of people claim that they support privacy, that they support human rights and all these other things, but they just, they literally don't care. I do think there is a portion of people that do care, but at the same time, um, it's not a money maker. It's not something that people are focusing on really primarily because there's not a lot of money in it right now, especially when we see public servants like blindly attacking people. Like the stuff that's happening with Tornado Cash, with the Tornado Cash developers, absolutely atrocious. And just the statements that we see from American public servants kind of, slamming you know crypto and saying it's it's to fund you know bad transactions etc i just i feel like a lot of people are just scared to create just because they're scared to be persecuted and it's just unfortunate that that's happening but i think at the same time there are people that are still building silently and again i'm working with the project that's focusing on privacy and trying to you know get things easy to use for the masses because at the end of the day they're going to be like people like me average people we're going to be the ones that need it the most yeah, definitely. I, I think um, to the you know, comments from an earlier speaker, basically, it's kind of one of those things that maybe is going to be built outside of the U.S. So maybe one of those unique things that um, you know just kind of has to be based on the issues that are surrounding it. Well, you um, can't build. You literally can't. Really quickly, and I'll, I'll shut up after this. But you literally cannot build anything in the U.S. right now. Like in a lot of the companies that I do talk to, and a lot of people that I do talk to that are building, it's like I always ask them, "Do you have an attorney?" And they're like, "Yes." And a lot of times, they have to. Um, create these companies overseas and figure out how to kind of navigate the current landscape because again we don't have any clear regulation um of course the sec says that we do but then we have all these other entities that are kind of coming into crypto and they're trying to figure out how to regulate us and what to do and i think people are just scared and it honestly sucks as an entrepreneur um to kind of come up with something that's really cool that's really unique and then figure out that you can't participate in that market because there's no regulations or because it's going to be an uphill battle and it just absolutely sucks so my heart's goes out to all the devs and all the people that are actively building and fighting for privacy and equality in that aspect. Yeah, definitely. And it was interesting to hear the prior speaker um, who, was, who was here was talking about like sort of the, the interesting structures U.S. teams have to go around it to, to do that, like creating a Cayman structure and a VVI structure, you know, in order to do token launches if you're a U.S. based company. And uh, I mean, it just sounds like a lot of work. I mean, we're, we're doing our best. Uh, you know, I think crypto we still have some great crypto companies in the U.S. despite <laughs> our government and uh, regulators' you know, best efforts, you know, not because of, right? And it really should be, you know, the latter, not, not the former. Um, but yeah, great comments. Um, yeah, I think we'll go to Douglas next. Uh, Douglas, what do you think of privacy on the blockchain? Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so this, this is something I, I'm very passionate about. Uh, really appreciate you guys inviting me to this talk today. I see there's like, I don't know, thousands of people in this room. Um, the, the, the topic is why are they afraid of privacy coins? They are afraid, well, they want you to think they are afraid of privacy coins because it can be used to finance terrorism, it can be used for money laundering, uh, just like cash can. That's, that's what they want you to think as to why they are afraid, why governments are afraid. But what they're really afraid of is that privacy coins uh, work as intended as uh, Satoshi Nakamoto originally envisioned with, in terms of what Bitcoin is supposed to be. So the ability of people to transact peer to peer and without privacy, you fundamentally really can't do that. Right. So what they're afraid of is cryptocurrency is really what they're afraid of. They're afraid of a working version of peer to peer digital cash. And the reason they fear that is because that empowers the people that allows people to transact freely without any corporation or government to be, you know, be a middleman, to be able to be in the middle of that transaction or to surveil that transaction or to censor that transaction. So they're afraid of the power ultimately that it gives the people at the end of the day um, and specifically they're afraid of the fact that they can't easily tax everyone's transactions if everyone's transactions are fundamentally private that's where the real fear comes in but they're portraying death and, death and taxes right douglas death and taxes there's not there are only two certainties in life and that's death and taxes yeah, in the in the eyes of a government, uh, but in the eyes of cypherpunks, we're you know we're trying to build tools that uh, essentially don't allow governments to take their pound of flesh at will, right? So the the whole value proposition of crypto from day one was to build a system outside of the control of governments and corporations, allowing freedom and liberty to prevail in the digital age without government surveillance or or censorship. And so that that's what they're afraid. Of. They're afraid of this tech is actually working. Uh, Bitcoin, um, you well, know. So, Bitcoin so, Douglas, I mean, it just just on that point, I mean, I'm generally like in agreement about uh, the things that Bitcoin can do. But I mean, surely you wouldn't say 
I mean, someone that said earlier, you know, governments have a monopoly on violence. I think that's generally true. Um, has been true for for a long time, uh, and uh, you know, we can go back to Rousseau and Hobbes about the whole like civil society and what it means. But like, surely you wouldn't say that. Well, I don't know. If you do say this, that'll be interesting. Like, governments don't deserve any taxes. You're not saying that, right? I mean, governments surely surely deserve some kind of taxes for services they provide. I think you're just saying that. Go- maybe. Governments, well, what are you governments, saying? Yeah. yeah, governments don't deserve the ability to extract taxes at will. Right. Um, and that that's a direction we're headed in with CBDCs. And I would say with even Bitcoin being a perfectly. What, what's the difference like, between taxes at will versus what what the, like what are the two modes you're talking about? Taxes at will is one. And what's the other mode that you think is better? I'm, ta- I'm talking about living in a world where governments can just extract taxes uh, because they know everybody's transactions. They can clearly see them on a blockchain. Right. As opposed to the way things have traditionally actually been done, where people uh, submit their taxes. Right. Right? They say, all right, here, here, here's what happened in this past year. Uh, here's all the taxes I believe I owe. And there's, there's a big difference there. Um, and so crypto and projects like Monero in particular move us towards a cash-based society, like the way things used to be, um, but does it in digital form. So the, 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 the real fear is, you know, with CBDCs and transparent blockchains like Bitcoin, is that we uh, evolve into a society that's perfectly surveilled, right? Um, and, that's, and all our data is completely tracked and traced. And what, what, is that, what does that do? That ends, up, that ends up killing liberty, that ends up killing our, our ability to act as individuals. Where taxation comes into play is it, it empowers governments um, and pe- the people, individuals. I mean, it's, it's literally the reason why America was founded, right? Why, why we had, why we had, why we had the, the revolution, right? No taxation without representation, right? We, you know, so what, what crypto does is it evens the playing field. Uh, it empowers people. And it allows them to participate on their own accord, right? And, uh, and opt into governments as they wish, as opposed to governments using their force to extract uh, t- taxes at will. So uh, mm, crypt- crypto levels the playing field and uh, give, gives the power back to the people, which is what governments are ultimately very fearful of. I mean, you can look at uh, yeah, Monero, yeah, so, Monero in particular. There was an yeah, IRS there was an IRS bounty that was put out for, for Monero for, I don't know, it was like $600,000 or something to try to crack Monero. Um, and then I, I think I heard you mention that Monero uh, was popular, but it has since been proven that you can trace Monero. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's just fun. So that that's not the case at all. I mean, if you look at... Uh, that's just something I heard. And by the way, I wasn't like asserting that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just, there was I'm like just a, trying there was to... Like a, uh, there was a research project that said that they could trace something like 10, 15, or maybe even 20% of Monero transactions uh, if you had, like, you know, the, the right resources. I don't know if that's true, but I just saw some, some people. Yeah, yeah there, there's, uh, that's, not complete, that's not completely inaccurate. There are, uh, you know, people that are doing research trying to do things, but there is no, there is no proven ability to track and trace Monero. Um, there, there, are, there are ways that you can gain insights into transactions, particularly if people misuse it by going through centralized exchanges. Uh, but when you're just using Monero peer-to-peer, it's pretty much impossible to gain any insights into, into what's going on there, who's sending what to who, and what amount. There are no, there are no dex, good DEX bridges. Well, first off, I don't think uh, you can U.S. users use it in, in CFI exchanges because, I mean, it's not on, for example, um, you know, Coinbase. But number two is there uh, a DeFi way to do it, right, through a bridge? Like, if you want to take your Ethereum, you know, go, you know, punch it through. Uh, yeah, there are. Well, for, first off, you know, Monero still is listed on sub exchanges, so it's still on Kraken. Kraken yeah, Binance, uh, KuCoin, Kraken, I think. Those are the places. Uh, those Bi- places. Well, Binance, Binance, Binance delisted. Binance is delisting it, right? Oh, that's that's the big it. news. Uh, that's that's why we recently saw a crash in Monero's price, the delisting of Binance, although people in Monero are kind of celebrating the delistings. Uh, people in Monero have been waiting for this for, for a very long time. It's, it's not a surprise. Um, it's always been about building out peer-to-peer digital cash that no corporation or government can, can fuck with, right? And so, uh, as we're saying, that, that, that's, that's why they're afraid. Uh, legally, yeah, though, to, to play the devil's advocate, and I do want to go to the other hands, because I mean, this is so fascinating. I feel like everyone, every speaker has brought up so many fascinating things that like, we're sticking to, to, to these combos. But uh, I do want to move on to like, you know, Terrence and David and, and Powell. But question I have for you there is, sure, 
I, I think that's the reason, right? I mean, even just going back to the original Satoshi white paper, right? The ability to have, you know, free, you know, money and, and be free. But, you know, the, the, the arm of the U.S. government is, is long. And I think we see that with CZ, right? CZ was like hanging out in Dubai and, you know, which is non-extradition treaties with, um, you know, the U.S. So he didn't have to come and, and fly into Washington state, but he did um, because, you know, he, I think he, I'm sure he's not a dumb guy, right? He's, he's not, he's a very smart guy. And he made the calculus, hey, you know, I think it's better if I just deal with the U.S. government, right? So in this case, so, um, you know, I mean, sure, you could do all these things. You could do things, but uh, like I said, I mean, the U.S. is still the dominant superpower. It still has a large GDP, a nominal GDP. It still has the biggest yeah, military so what, what, by what are you far. Saying, though? What are you saying there? Well, so. what I'm saying is, you know, it's funny. Well, because I, it's more of a devil's advocate. Like, sure, this is, this is the future we, we are, quote, wanting to build in crypto. But if the U.S. government really wants to do something, they're going to do something, regardless of whether you're on Monero or some blockchain that they can't quote access. Right? They're going to figure out a way uh, to. Yeah, to I mean to. that. That's. I mean that's where I. I, I mean I, I guess I would disagree with you, right? Uh, you know. The, well, the that's why I posed it. I figured you would, so that's yeah. why I want to hear your response to it. Yeah. So, so my response is uh, the, the cypherpunk vision and Satoshi Nakamoto's vision of of basically building a tool that governments don't have power over. And that, that was what, that's what the breakthrough invention was, right? So it really levels the playing field. At the end of the day, what it's using that levels the playing field is math and encryption, right? So as strong, as infinitely strong as governments seem to be, uh, yes, they have a monopoly over violence, but they don't have a monopoly over math. They don't have a monopoly over encryption. And encryption levels the playing field. So it doesn't matter how strong an adversary is. If you're using good encryption, Governments can't deal with it, and that's what they're terrified of. And then, so the question really comes down to a matter of: uh, Do you have more trust in government, like like the United States government, or people in general, in terms of uh, leading to, leading us towards a uh, more fruitful and free and liberated society? So, do you do you trust humanity with having these tools in their hands, or do you, or would you rather have a government that doesn't allow humanity to have these tools? And so that, that's that's really kind of the question that's being asked. And the tools now exist. Uh, the cat is out of the bag. And now it's up to us as society to, to decide, do we want to adopt these tools? Do we think it will lead to a more uh, free, universally free world? Uh, if so, all we have to do is adopt them and use them. And there's literally nothing governments can do to stop it. Uh, mm -hmm. If you think otherwise, then yeah, you're, you're on the side of the state. You're on the side of big government. And you think that, you know, you need big daddy government to take care of the people because the people can't take care of themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's less, well, I mean, we're going to move to the pitch, by the way, now, just from timing. I feel like I could talk about this forever. It was less, the way I was saying it was not like, oh, what I support or what I don't support, what I want, and what I don't want, but more of a acknowledgement of reality that we could build the, the most cryptographically secure, quantum secure protocol that we want. But, you know, there's still things in the real world that like, to, just because you have you know, you know, just because you have it uh, secure on the blockchain doesn't necessarily mean security, right? In the practical sense, was was more of my. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, good gov governments. Governments are really strong, especially the U.S. government. But no, I, I do think at the end of the day, this tool is so powerful that even they are unable to stop it. I mean, I'm running right now on my computer. Uh, I'm mining Monero with a click of a button. I could pull up the software. I could, you know, download the blockchain. I could send transactions to people. Uh, it's it's just re it's just re going to be really hard impossibly hard for government i mean they would have to like, basically make it illegal for you to run software on your on your computer and you know we've al we've already had these battles right in the us uh the constitution does actually you know does exist free speech does exist uh, we've seen these battles take place with PGP encryption in, in the 90s when they tried to essentially make that illegal and it was found to, you know, uh, be unconstitutional to try to, to try to make that illegal. So um, at the end of the day, yeah, gov government. Well, what about uh, what about 19? What about in the 1930s when was it FDR did executive order, the executive order for where you had to submit your gold? Right. So gold was away. We we're on the gold standards before, you know, Bretton Woods. I mean, like. You know, so so now you are re required. So if something like that happened with crypto, right? Like yeah. what would what would happen, right? I mean, suddenly you're you're stuck in a really hard place, right? You know, yeah. It's like they don't know you you have crypto. Like people can figure it out, right? Based on IP on sex uh, centralized exchanges and stuff like that. So I mean. You know, yeah, I mean, well, you know, that that's why we have to build these things to where they don't know. And you know, what would happen is, unfortunately, I think what would happen is. 
things very similar to what we saw with COVID, right? A lot of the sheep would just go along with it, but you'd have a lot of people that wouldn't comply. You know, I know I didn't comply. Uh, I never, I never got the vax. Uh, you know, I didn't comply to other things they mandated. A lot of people stood up against it. And I think that opened up a lot of people's eyes. Even those people that did comply are now thinking, wait, why did I listen to the government? So I think what you would see is you'd create a situation where, yeah, sure, if everybody complies, then yeah, it's over. But if people don't comply and use the power of these tools, uh, the people do win. Uh, that's that's how it's going to play out. But yeah, it's a matter of people not complying. Super interesting insights. Well, you know, I know we got hands, but we're going to have to save them for the AMA and questions to Venket and Serenity, who are here for the team, because we are at that uh, time frame. Really wanted to hear from Terrence, David, and Powell, but, uh, but do, uh, do please tee up your questions uh, for our sponsor for today. So uh, basically, you know, um, I'm really excited to have our partner, Serenity, uh, here. Um, and uh, I'm going to have Venket here talking about basically all the issues that we've been talking about, uh, you know, earlier. So, you know, basically, uh, Serenity is focused on democratizing Web3 and harmonizing Web2 with Web3 and effectively empowering individuals with privacy uh, and security. And so, yeah, I mean, it's uh, exciting. So, Venkat, I'd love to give you the mic and, and tell us what you think and uh, introduce the audience here to Serenity. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm Venkat Naga, and one, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Serenity Shield. And first, I would like to clarify, we are not a privacy coin, actually. Uh, Serenity Shield, we are... Uh, decentralized privacy centric blockchain data storage application so we are in the business of data storage and using our application we promote privacy security confidentiality and data autonomy data sovereignty and data ownership that's what we do so from that point of view as we all know data storage is a very big business because in the coming years, it's estimated that the data storage is going to be exceeding 175 zettabytes, which is trillions of data, of gigabytes of data. So right now, when all the data is stored in the centralized servers, the third-party servers, the need for the full autonomy and ownership of data storage in a blockchain-based privacy-centric solution is becoming extremely pivotal. And that's where Sanity Shield or projects like Sanity Shield are going to play a very big role, and that's what we do. Because one of the things is that the users for our solution, they can store any form of a digital data. It could be a PDF, audio, video, text file, doc file, etc., etc. So that means we have a solution or an application to everyone to be able to store their digital data with us in a decentralized form with full ownership and control of the data with as much as least amount of hacking or breaches as much as minimal as possible. And that's what we do. And as I said, we are in the business of blockchain-based, privacy-centric data storage solution. And of course, we have a solution for everyone. And why it is becoming more and more important and critical, because I've been hearing to all the co-speakers and it was a great speech. We did touch upon, you know, the mass adoption. I think that's one of the major features, which is sort of, I would say, as a guy coming from the blockchain space and the Web3 space is, the major issue that we are facing is the mass adoption because people are still sort of confused that, you know, they are confusing that blockchain technology and crypto are very much synonymous to each other. But I have to say here that blockchain technology as a whole is much, much larger than crypto and crypto is just a piece of it. And that's why when we want to position Sanity Shield, we always say that we are positioning ourselves as a kind of a digital bridge and as a digital gateway between the Web2 and the Web3 worlds, because I'm typically, I'm a Web2 guy. And I've come into Web3 because I was fascinated by the potential that the blockchain technology can offer. Because tokenization is a great concept, right? This is because, of course, we did touch upon the concept of RWA and the tokenization of real-world assets. Yes, it is going to be a trillion-dollar industry. Of course, it is still premature. It's too early. But one of the points which was raised by one of the co-speakers is, you are trying to skip away from the centralized platforms to avoid the centralized platforms to sort of control your monetization of your digital assets. But when you do that, you create tokens, you create NFTs, but where do you store them, right? That's where people like Senate Shield, we will play a role because number one, we are going to adopt artificial intelligence into our solution. So the AI protocol is going to decide which are the nodes 
where our distributed data is going to be stored. So that's going to enhance the security and the privacy protocol. Again, I'm talking about here. Let's, let me make it clear. As Serenity Shield, we are not talking about anonymity of our users and transactions. That's a completely different business model. We are talking about the privacy and the confidentiality of the user's data storage and trying to escape from the glitches in the hands of the so-called centralized uh, third-party service providers today for data storage. So coming back to that, in terms of we are going to deploy AI, which is artificial intelligence, and that's going to decide the nodes where the distributed data is going to be stored, number one. And number two, we are also going to come up with a solution of biometrics as an entry point into a solution. Because one of the major problems today is awareness, knowledge, and usability. Of course, some of our co speakers today, they talked about CBDC, central bank digital currencies, but let's not forget how many of the masses that we are targeting today even know how to create a wallet, right? Whereas wallet creation is going to be a major sort of an aspect of the blockchain technology for its usability. And that's why people like us, to make that bridge between the web two uses so we can get into that mainstream adoption, we are getting into biometrics. So that means people don't even need a wallet to get into a solution. Biometrics can be an entry point. And we are also doing a hardware wallet integration into a blockchain solution. What does that mean? So the digitized, the tokenized digital assets, they can be stored in the hardware wallet. And then with the biometrics at an entry point, and the private key to that hardware wallet can be stored in our blockchain decentralized solution. And one of the unique features that we have in our solution is also a kind of an inheritance protocol. I would not call it a real estate planning feature, but it's a kind of an inheritance protocol where the primary user can design his own inheritance protocol and he can give the access to his confidential information which is being stored with us to his designated nominee or heir based upon the inheritance protocol that he is designing. So now let me make it sort of, you know, to put it in a very simple sort of a way to explain it. We have a biometrics hardware entry point. So users don't have to create their own wallet. And then we have an integrated solution of a hardware wallet with a decentralized blockchain data storage solution. So the tokenized real world assets can be stored in the hardware wallet. And of course, you need a private key for the hardware wallet. You could store the private key of the hardware wallet in a blockchain solution, which is decentralized. And you could assign the access to that data stored with us to your designated nominee or head. So people like us, of course, it's premature. There's still a lot of uh, sort of things which are acting as entry barrier towards mass adoption. But people like us, we are thinking a lot. We are investing a lot of time and efforts to give a sort of a 360 degree solution to prepare the whole system, maintaining a certain level of regulatory and statutory controls. And that's why I keep saying that we are not a privacy coin. We promote privacy. We promote security. We promote confidentiality. But we do not promote anonymity, at least as our business model. So sitting within a certain framework of regulatory norms, etc., if we are able to provide a 360 degree solution of decentralized data storage and with the ability for the user to store his digital assets, tokenized assets, NFTs on a hardware wallet, which will be integrated to our blockchain data storage solution, I think people like us, we are really targeting a 360 degree solution for what is going to come and giving an option for the amount of digital data that is going to be generated in the future for people mm. to have an option to store them in a de decentralized platform. And that's what we are doing. And we have our own native token called the Search, which has been listed recently, but that's just to tokenize that technology. But overall, all we talk about is technology, technology and the product of decentralized data storage application. Yeah, so it was a great uh, overview, Venkat. Thanks for that. And a question I have for you, well, I have many questions, but one of them is around, you know, I mean, there's existing data storage, right? I mean, there's like Filecoin and, and sort of what's happening uh, there. I mean, you know, in Bitcoin, people are starting to put stuff into the block space, right? I mean, in, in small amounts, uh, you know, you have up to four megabyte block size, but uh, usually to, you know, mint an ordinal, it's like, you know, you only have really a few hundred kilobytes. And then people are starting to put stuff into Ethereum as well, though it's more expensive. So I guess compared to those, um, yeah, what's uh, I, I guess, how do you do things in a way like have storage, be, have it be immutable for data, 
um, and then have it be secure. Like what's what's different about what's existing or what's going to exist versus uh, versus these other solutions. Of course, you know we do have a, both of an IPFS platform and a non IPFS platform, which is going to handle both aspects of the storage in terms of the the security protocol. You have we have multi grade encryption, so that's one. And then also we have a mass data storage option for businesses can come and store their data as well because we have a B two B vertical, so businesses can come and store their data under multi user application and also uh, ability to able to even monetize the data. For example, the DMSs and the LMSs, which is the data management system and the library management systems, can be stored on chain in a completely decentralized manner, where businesses can also monetize the data. And some of the unique features where we have is it's just not an application. We are creating an entire infrastructure and ecosystem, and we are not using. any sort of a third party service providers involved which brings a certain amount of centralization that's one of the major differences from many of our competitors because even one of our competitor ledger i mean just to name uh, they came up with the provision to store the private key wait you consider ledger you consider ledger a competitor like ledger the the france based uh, our wallet Yes, we do consider Ledger as a competitor in a certain mm-hmm. sense. Yes, but then of course, when they wanted to give an option for the users to store the private key, what they did was they split it into different parts and they handed over those parts to third-party storage providers, which again that created sort of a big uproar in the market because we are trusting you and we are putting our assets over there here, but you are splitting the private key of my storage and you are giving it to third-party service providers, right? So that's the kind of sort of it's a kind of a confusion which is prevailing is that how do you manage this whole thing in a manner that you are able to manage this whole thing completely decentralized without compromising the core principles of a decentralized blockchain data storage solution it's a kind of a challenge right and that's what people like do and that's how we are unique and different yeah it's super interesting about ai um you know what are the ways in which ai will be integrated and, and the question i ask around this is because You know, in the AI space, uh, there's of course, uh, you know, cloud-based solutions like uh, LLMs, like obviously GPT-4 and things like that, where all your data is going to OpenAI in that case. Whereas if you use like Llama, for example, Llama 2, and you have it running on-prem, like on your computer with NVIDIA graphics cards, and then you then insert your enterprise's data into there, then you could, in theory, keep it private. But like the insertion of any AI has a risk of like basically. I mean, this is why enterprise AI is going to be like a big space um, if, for people for people to get it right. Because basically, if you like try to do a, G, a GPT integration, uh, you know, with the APIs, all your data is going to OpenAI, right? Like OpenAI is just collecting all that stuff. So, by the way, for anybody using ChatGPT, I'm sure you know anything you type in, even if you click the quote delete button, will be used to train future models and would be kept forever. So, just I'm, I'm sure, hopefully, people know that. But you know, if you don't, then here's your here's your wake up call. But uh, Yeah, I mean, how will AI be integrated? Like, and how do you? How will it be? How will it maintain privacy? Because AI and privacy don't really mix, generally speaking. No, of course, uh, I will again try to keep it simple because you know, even if there is a monster, you have to know how to use the monster and get what you want out of them, right? So that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to keep it sort of simple in the sense that today, in a blockchain decentralized data storage application that we have, the nodes on which the data the split data is going to be stored in a decentralized format the nodes are sort of calculated by the internal api of our system and that you know that might have some vulnerabilities because it is being created by our own system api and that's what is going to be replaced by the ai protocols and the ai models and that's why we don't want to have too much of involvement so to say that it becomes too intelligent we are going to use the ai protocols to determine which are the nodes where the data will be stored which will have the least amount of vulnerability in terms of hacking or breaches or any sort of a compromise that could happen otherwise if we are going to use a system api so our role of api i mean sorry ai will be their protocols to decide the nodes on which the decentralized data is going to be stored which in our opinion is going to sort of enhance again our privacy and security protocols all related to the data storage application super cool thank you um well i think we're coming to towards the end of this uh you know fascinating space um what would you like to leave uh, venkat what would you like to leave our audience with closing thoughts uh, about serenity shield and uh, just privacy in general yeah no privacy in general it's a very very broad subject 
of course, you know, uh, privacy as far as Senate Shield is concerned, for us, privacy means confidentiality and security. It is not an anonymity because we have gone to great lengths to demonstrate that privacy, accountability and trackability can coexist. That's what we are trying to achieve. And we are achieving this business of digital data storage, which is going to be trillions of dollars of industry. And again, talking about RWA and interface between Trade 5 and DeFi, etc., we will have a very pivotal role, even with the CBDCs, because when all those real-world assets are going to be tokenized, NFTs and those tokens, we will provide a platform to store them with a very simple biometric entry point and also with a sort of in-design inheritance protocol where you can designate the access to that information to your higher nominee, in which case we are also solving one of the major entry barriers for mass adoption. What happens to your digital assets when, God forbid, you happen to die? So we are trying to provide an entire ecosystem. So this project, as you can see, has a great future because we are sticking within the security, I mean, privacy and security, but at the same time also being accountable and trackable. So we have our search token, which is a listed token, and that is a deflationary model of token. Please follow our socials, Instagram, Twitter, Telegram, obviously, Discord, etc. And come and be a part of it. And then, of course, it's a very interesting project to follow. And I'm sure people like us, we will have an enormous amount of value proposition coming forward because we will truly become a bridge between the Web2 and the Web3 world. And we will move this whole digital space into mass adoption. That's, a, that's an amazing message. Um, thank you so much. Uh, you know, actually, you know, I wish we could go to the hands, but we, I am, I'm told we are out of time now. So we'll have to ask the questions later. But thank you. That was great. I appreciate it. Uh, for the audience, please follow all the speakers. Please uh, follow uh, Serenity and follow Venket, and we'll see. Have to see in the coming months and years what uh, what the project yields and what it brings. Uh, we're excited to see the developments. All right, folks, we do these at 9 a.m. Pacific. I look forward to seeing y'all in the next one. Thanks so much.